to all the moms, all the grandmothers here in the room, watching online or outside. Uh, we're so glad you are here. We want to honor you guys today. Uh, my name is Greg. I'm one of the pastors here. And I want to start off by just sharing um, a story. The, the New York Times was asked by a, a women's club to name the 12 greatest women in the United States. And so they thought about it, and the editors of the New York Times, they, they concluded, well, the 12 greatest women in the United States are women who have never been heard of outside of their own homes. Nobody would know who they are. Like, for example, no one knows who Nancy Matthews Elliott is. She's a former school teacher. Uh, she used to teach in the education system but stopped to take care of her family. But when her son was sent home one day, the teacher sent him home with a note. And when she read the note, the note read, your son is dumb. We cannot do anything for him. She wrote back to the school, to the teacher. She said, well, you do not understand my boy, so I will teach him myself. And so Nancy Matthews Elliott decided to go back to teaching, and she homeschooled her son. And over the course of the next few years, she not only taught him the stuff he should learn, but she also put principles into her son. She just taught him principles over and over again. Many principles. Let me just share with you three that she would teach her son over and over again. Here's the first one. She says, son, do not be afraid to fail. Keep trying and learn from your failure. And then try again. Another principle she put in him was, it's okay to work with your hands and your head. Not everything important comes from books. One more principle that I want to share with you this morning is that Son, you should read and learn about everything, not just what you like, not just the things you like. Well, dumb little Thomas Edison would apply these lessons from his mother, and he would, he would continue to apply them and commit to them, and he credits her love and her teaching and her patience with him as being the very foundation for which he was able to accomplish all that he has done. And so if there's anybody in this room who has ever benefited from incandescent lights, from electricity and recorded sounds and motion pictures and alkaline batteries and the list goes on and on, then we should probably be singing songs about Nancy Matthews Elliott for the way she has helped impact this world. And yet she is an unsung hero, the unsung hero who has educated Thomas Edison. I look around the room, and I'm sure many people listening, there, there are many unsung heroes among us, many unsung heroes. I wish we could celebrate them all. Our team put together a video to celebrate some of the unsung heroes here in our church family. So check out this video they put together. my day brighter and you are the best mommy a child would ever wish for. Uh, dear mom, I know that 2020 and the beginning of 2021 has uh, been really hectic for you as you have the three of us at home. Dear mom, thank you for raising me to have strong faith in the Lord. It amazes me each day how much care you put into making meals for us and shopping to care for our needs. You've done so much for the three of us. I mean, we're all like 16 and older and you still do way too much for us. I mean, up until, up until this past year, you were still cooking dinners for everyone and um, you worked so many jobs just to support all of us. Dear Mommy, I want you to know that your tenacity of keeping your kids together and in harmony is something that we are strongly keeping. Your seven kids together with spouses communicate eat every single day even just to say good morning and send blessings for that day. We believe this makes you so happy in heaven. I ended up going back to school um, to get my master's and a big reason to do that was because of my mom. A lot of the things that I strive for and a lot of things that I push for and like kind of the, the greatness that I try to pursue and, and how I want to live my life, a lot of it comes from my mom's hard work and dedication. Your ambition to create a gym and continue to train your clients through the pandemic is truly inspiring. You continue to strive to support those around you in the best ways possible, even through the crazy times of the pandemic. And you make, make this 
sun more bright and the night more calm. You took me places up until like a couple of months ago when now I got my driver's license and not only that, you're the one that pushed me to get it, you're the one that scheduled my appointment, you're the one that told me to do driver's ed. <laughs> Thank you for pushing me to do all the things that I can do now and I just don't know how I can ever repay you. Uh, just around this time every year, Mother's Day just makes me think about how much being part of this family and being your son really means to me. You're like the engine of this family and I, I've realized how important this time was for our family and how much time we really got to spend together and how that's not always going to be the case. Beautiful Mama, it has been a year since you have been gone. We, your kids and grandchildren, deeply carry you in our hearts and we thank you every single day for all the love that you provided for us. Your generosity and selflessness is an amazing aspect of who you are and something that I strive to live by. Although it may not always seem like it, and sometimes I annoy you, I am thankful for you. My heart is, is happy and it's warming because I have such a great mommy. I love you and I'm so grateful to have you as a mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day to everyone. I love this so much. I love you too, Mommy. You're the best. You too. <laughs> yeah, one more time. Let's honor all the mothers and the grandmothers who have done so much to raise us and, and, and help produce the people that we've become today. And I know that there are so many more unsung heroes among us. And I wish I had all the time in the world to sit here and recognize each one. And I'm sure there are stories after story of behind the scene faithfulness to, to tell of why you are the people you are today and the impact so many of, of you are having today. And much of it is due to the faithfulness of your mom. But what I wanna do today is I wanna, I wanna look at a couple unsung heroes in the Bible. And I want to show you some mothers who show some godly wisdom throughout their life. And I want to exhort every one of us listening. So this is for everyone listening, whether you're mom, grandmother, father, son, brother, sister, single. This is for everyone listening. And I want to exhort you to, to see their godly wisdom and do likewise. And as I'm sharing these stories of these unsung heroes, if anything resembles the mother in your household or the mother in your life, I want to encourage you personally, just stop and give glory. Praise God for, for that, that influence, that person that God has put in your life as we're going through this message. But before we do that, let's pray and let's ask the Lord to open the, the word to us. Father God, we want to just take this very intentional pause right now. And God, we want to invite you to come and stir in our hearts, God. Help us to look into your word, and I pray that you would help us to see godliness, that you would help us to see righteousness. And I pray that every one of us listening, Lord, wherever we are, whether we're here in this room or in some other city or even country, Lord, I pray that we would all hear the same voice, the voice of your Holy Spirit speaking truth to us. And I pray, Lord, that we would be filled with so much thanks, Lord, that our hearts would just want to praise you for the goodness you have given us in our lives, the blessings you have poured upon us specifically in the ones who brought us into this world. We know they're not perfect. Lord, we're all sinners. We all fall short. We make mistakes. But, Lord, there's so much good to recognize, and I pray that we would do that all day, all weekend, and even beyond. And so, Lord, take this time. Make it yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. Amen. This past Wednesday, I was uh, mountain biking with a good friend of mine, Dale Choi. He's, he's actually in my life group, 37-year-old husband and a father of three. He has three little kids. And as we were riding bikes, we were just talking about prayer. And he was telling me how his mom recently told him that she still prays for him every day. This 37-year-old guy, his mom prays for him every day and his wife and his three little children by name. And then he says... And she told me that my grandma in Korea still prays for me and my wife and my three little children by name. 
And, and he was just kind of amazed. He's like, man, how does grandma even remember the names of my kids? They've never met personally yet. They've, they haven't had a chance to, to bring the kids over to Korea to introduce them to great grandma. So how does she remember their names? And then he concluded, he says, well, but I guess if you're praying for people every day, it's not difficult to remember their names. When you're praying for someone every day, your heart is drawn towards them. Of course you remember their names. And as he was sharing that with me, he was marveling at the fact that his grandma should remember to lift up his children's names. But you know what would amaze me as I thought about it? What amazed me is that this 37-year-old man still lifts up the name of Jesus. Why does that amaze me? Well, because I've had many, many friends in high school who were church-going and were Christians, and yet today no longer walk with Jesus. And I know a lot of friends that I actually served with in ministry in college, in our college fellowship, who today no longer walk with Jesus. And my reflections of these, these former Christian friends of mine reflect the actual statistics, like LifeWay Research and Campus Renewal tell us about 65 to 70 percent of people after they graduate high school stop walking with Jesus. They disengage from church and disengage from Christianity. Most people stop walking in faith. And so why in the world has Dale, this 37-year-old man, still today, why does he still walk with Jesus? Oh, I dare anybody to try to convince me that a faithfully praying mother and a faithfully praying grandmother has nothing to do with it. I think there is more power than you know when a mother is faithfully committed to the spiritual well-being of her children. And, and, and a grandmother's commitment to the spiritual well-being of her grandchildren is more powerful than you know. And for that, for that matter, fathers, your spiritual commitment to the spiritual well-being of your children is more powerful than you will ever realize. Most people stop walking with Christ. Why hasn't Dale? I believe it's the faithfulness of a praying mother and a praying grandmother. It has much to do with it. Now, what Dale didn't know was that the night before, on Tuesday evening, I had been studying the book of 1 Timothy, or actually 2 Timothy, and I had been reading 2 Timothy in preparation for this message. He had no idea what I was studying, but in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is writing to this pastor, this leader of the church in Ephesus, this great city of Ephesus, and here's what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. He says, Timothy... I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure, I'm certain, it dwells in you as well. And then in chapter 3, a couple chapters later, in verses 14 and 15, Paul exhorts this Timothy. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, your mother and your grandmother, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Lois and Eunice are rarely ever sung about, yet these are some unsung heroes who planted seeds of faith, and those seeds of faith in Timothy helped bloom and produced the fruit of a lifelong devoted follower of Jesus Christ and their legacy of faith that that they were leaving was not just left in Timothy but their legacy of faith was impacting the eternities of people who would be saved through the Ephesian church soul upon soul upon soul who would be impacted by the shepherding and the spiritual leadership of Timothy have much thanks to give to the legacy of Lois and Eunice and so when I hear about the faithfulness, I read about the faithfulness of a praying mother and a praying grand, grandmother of Timothy. And I hear about the faithfulness of Dale Choi's mother and grandmother. It shouldn't surprise me or any of us that these two kids walked into adulthood still walking with Jesus. They still walk with with Jesus. And so here's a takeaway. If you're writing notes, if you care to write this down, write this. Here's a takeaway. 
Nothing happens overnight. But significant things happen over many nights. This is what, what these godly mothers understand, that nothing happens overnight, but significant things happen over many nights. And some of you guys have been praying for your children or your grandchildren, and they're away from the Lord. Maybe they're in their adult years and they're distant. Keep praying. Don't stop praying because nothing happens overnight. And this is an invaluable truth that everyone listening, we can take away. In whatever sphere of life, we can apply this godly wisdom. Right? I mean, any sector of life. Stephen Curry, I was thinking about the other day, he didn't become one of the greatest shooters in NBA history overnight. It didn't come overnight from his own mouth. He says it took day after day, night after night, committing to making 500 shots a day before he laid his bed, head down at night. I was talking about Frank Morris with my son. He's reading a book about Alcatraz. And we realized that Frank Morris didn't make the greatest escape from Alcatraz overnight. Took night after night taking a spoon from the cafeteria Night after night, digging at the wall until there was breakthrough. Didn't happen overnight. And I look at Timothy. He didn't become the spiritual leader of the great city of Ephesus, the evangelist, the shepherd, and the pastor who was impacting souls for eternity overnight. It took countless nights of his mother and his grandmother training him in the faith, caring for his spiritual well-being. So remember, nothing happens overnight. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs 22.6. If you have your app open, turn to Proverbs 22.6. I want to show you a passage that you've probably heard before. This is a popular passage. But the Proverbs tell us, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. Circle that word train. I show you this passage because that's a pretty cool word right there. The word train. And what I want to show you about this word is, is that the original root word for this word train actually comes from a word that means palate, the roof of your mouth. Sometimes it refers to the gums. And, and the tradition was that when a baby was born, the, the midwife or the mom would take crushed date, dates and they would crush it and they would dip their finger in the juice of the crushed dates and they would massage the gums and massage the roof of the baby's mouth and that would create a sucking response the baby would start sucking because he was now wanting more he was desiring more and at that point the mother could take the child and begin to nurse without having to shove nutrients down the baby's throat because now the baby was actually desiring it wanting food wanting nutrition on his own and so in, in essence, the, the, the mom was wetting its appetite. And so when we look at Proverbs 22, 6, and it says, train up a child in the way he should go, what it's saying is that a godly parent, a godly mother is one who purposely develops in their child a hunger for the things that are good, a hunger for the things of the Lord, whether it's praying with them daily, night after night, day after day, whether it's looking for those teaching opportunities throughout the day, a single moment where you can teach them about Jesus. Maybe it's bringing them to church faithfully week after week. It's caring for their spiritual well-being day after day, night after night, because we realize nothing happens overnight. Nothing happens overnight. I was thinking about this story. Uh, when Evan was six years old, I took him to a Lakers game. And so it was just me, me and Evan. This is the actual night of that game. And, and uh, we're driving down the freeway. And you know it's that age where sometimes little boys have imaginary friends. They start talking to people. Well, we're driving down the 110 freeway to Staples Center. And as we're driving, I hear Evan talking. He's talking in the back seat. And I'm like, who's he talking to? And I listen closely. And I realize he's talking to God. He's talking to God, not an imaginary friend. But he starts praying. And I'm listening to what he's praying, and I kid you not, this is what he's praying. He's like, dear God, please help the Lakers win tonight, and please help them to make their three-pointers. <laughs> I'm like, are you serious? Like, he's literally praying that they make their three-pointers. I'm like, okay. Like, like, I'm a little more mature in my faith than Evan, more theologically sound. I don't know if God cares if the Lakers win or not. I don't know if he cares if they hit their threes or not. God is still going to be sovereignly sitting on his throne, running the universe. I don't know if he cares about the Lakers and their three-pointers. We get to Staples Center, 
And first quarter, we're, we get our seats, we're sitting there, and the Laker gets the ball, he steps behind a three-point line, shoots a three, and it goes in. And Evan goes, yeah, top of his lungs, yeah, God's answering our prayers. And I'm like, whoa, dude, that's, keep it down. <laughs> like, like, the flesh in me, the sinner in me was like, bro, keep it down, right? Like, don't, not so loud. And yet he was so excited that God was answering his prayer. And I, I, I thought about it. I don't want to shut that up. Inside my heart, I was like, you know what? Praise on. If God, if God is answering your prayers, praise on, right? So the game continues, and it goes on. Fourth quarter, Lakers are losing. Lakers are losing. And uh, I remember is they were down by two points, and it was down to the last few seconds of the game. Last few seconds. Uh, the ball goes to this player named D'Angelo Russell. He steps behind the three-point line, throws it up. And it goes and it doing, hits the rim, bounces up, and goes in. And he's like, yeah, praise the Lord. He, this is what we prayed for. And I was like, oh, man, this is crazy, right? And that night, I remember talking to Evan on the way home. I said to Evan, I said, Evan, I'm proud of you. I'm proud because you prayed and Daddy didn't have to tell you to pray. He just started praying. I said, keep, keep doing that. And here's why I thought about that story. I thought about that story because on Friday night here at the church, my wife and I, we got to speak to the young adult ministry. And we were talking about leadership, spiritual leadership. And one thing she shared with them that I didn't know she was going to share was how she saw spiritual leadership in our home. And she says, one of the ways I see is, is, is Greg teaches our kids to pray for all things, big and small, no matter what, they'll pray. And I've noticed that our kids will just start praying on their own, whether it's big or small. They get a scrape, they'll start praying. And when she said that, that, that actually really, that touched me, that encouraged me. Because I didn't know she was going to share that. I didn't even know she noticed that. But I say that. Not to pat myself, but I say that because when she shared that, I thought it immediately, we're sitting on the panel, I knew where it came from. My parents. My parents taught me as a child, they trained me to pray for anything, whatever it was, big or small, to always pray. I'll never forget the lesson when I was with my mom. My mom would always keep me company when I was sleeping. She would sit by my bed. And I remember one night laying there, I asked my mom, I said, Mom, can God hear me right now? She goes, yes. I said, Mom, can God hear me right now? She goes, yes. I said, Mom, can God hear me right now? She said, of course. I said, seriously? <laughs> yes. What? <laughs> like my mind was blown. He could hear that? Of course. He hears everything. He sees everything in your heart. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget her telling me that he knows everything. My dad, my, I grew up watching the Lakers too, Showtime Lakers, the best Lakers of all time. And, and we would watch, I remember watching on KCAL 9, we were watching this Laker game, and we, there's a Laker at the free throw line, and he shoots a free throw and misses. And my dad goes, see? Doesn't even take his time. He just throws it up. That's why he missed. He says, Greg, when you shoot a free throw, what I want you to do, you stand at the line, you hook, hold it here. And before you shoot, you start praying. <laughs> no joke. He's like, just pray that God will help you make it. And I'm like, that's crazy. But I would always do that. I would stop. I would pray, God, help me to make it. I'd shoot it, and I'd miss, like, all the time. I'd always miss. But I never forgot that. Always pray that God would help me. We'd be in San Francisco, Chinatown. Every, every year, we'd go visit my grandma. And every time we hit Powell Street right there in Chinatown, my dad would say, okay, we need to find parking. Parking in Chinatown is impossible. It's impossible. Right? So every time we hit Powell Street, all right, guys, start praying. Pray for a parking lot. Greg, you pray for us. Pray out loud. Go. And so I'm like, okay, dear God, please help us to find a parking space. And I would pray. And like two hours later, something would open up. See, praise God, you prayed, and God answered, give thanks, go ahead, pray out loud, and I would say, okay, God, thank you for providing, and I was taught always in everything to always pray, and so when Monica shares that that is something that our kids are now doing, I know where that came from. My parents trained me in the way that I should go, and now that I'm old, I have not departed from it. I have not departed from it. And to me, 
That's significant. And I'm realizing nothing significant happens overnight, but significant things happen over many nights, many nights of faithfulness, intention, commitment. Okay, so that's the first takeaway for all of us. Nothing significant happens overnight. Here's another takeaway I want to give you. You might want to write this down as well. Great, my greatest treasure is meant for God's glory. Even if you don't write this down, write it in your heart. My greatest treasure is meant for God's glory. Now, if you are a mother listening right now, you would probably say your, your children, your child is your treasure. And even if you wouldn't say that out loud, your actions would probably speak for you. There were these two unnamed women, and they both had children. They were their treasure. And, and uh, one of the infants dies. And so all of a sudden, these two women are fighting over the one that is still alive. Both of them want the child for themselves. And so they're fighting over the child. It's my baby. No, it's my baby. No, it's my baby. And they couldn't decide whose baby it was. And so they brought it to the wisest man in the kingdom. His name was King Solomon. And they say, King Solomon, this baby is mine. No, it's mine. No, it's mine. And, and King Solomon says, let me settle this. And I, I just imagine King Solomon takes that baby in his hand and he says, oh, how precious. I understand why both of you want this living baby. He says, let me solve it for you. Bring me a sword. Right, get me a sword. Let me just cut it in half. And then both of you guys can have the baby. Settled. And so he gets the sword, he's about to cut it in half, and then the one, one of the women says, okay, stop. She steps in, stop, 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 don't hurt him. Don't take his life. G give, it, give it to the other, other lady. Which of the two do you think was a real mom? Here's what 1 Kings 3.26 says. It says, the, then the woman whose son was alive, the real mom, said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son, Oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means put him to death. But the other said, he shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. The actual mother loved her child so much that she would do anything, anything to spare his life, even give him up to save him. And yet when the non-mother, who had no regard for him, she had no problem to give him up and say, hey, divide him, cut him up. What's the moral of the story? Well, mothers, they treasure their children. Mothers children, treasure their children. And I realize that's not something I need to preach this morning. I don't need to exhort mothers listening and say, mothers, you need to treasure your children. Mother, love your kids. I don't have to teach that. That would almost be a waste of our time because you do that. That's in you. That's who you are. That's innate. You've done it well, so I don't need to preach that this morning, but here's what I want to preach today. I want to say mothers treasure God's glory. Love God's glory. In fact, that's for everybody listening. Treasure God's glory. Love his glory so much that it becomes your highest priority in life. So much so that you will use whatever treasure you have, your greatest treasures in life, to use it for that very end to bring God glory. And so how can you use your treasure to give God great glory? There's an unsung mother in the Bible I, I want to tell you about. It's a mother who you probably don't hear much about. But she played a major role, major role in Israel's history. Her name was Jochebed. Anybody know who Jochebed is? Jochebed in her very name means God is glory. Jah is where we get Yahweh, the name of the Lord. Chabed is glory. God is glory. That's her name. And yet Jochebed gave birth to this little boy. And the king of Egypt at that time, the Pharaoh said, any Firstborn male, any son needs to be killed, thrown into the Nile River. Why? Because the Israelite people were blowing up. God was just keeping his promise that you're going to become a great nation and God's fulfilling it. And, he, and the Pharaoh wanted to control it. He wanted to stop the explosion. And so he says, kill all the firstborn sons. And Jochebed treasured her child. And she couldn't do it. I can't do it. So she hid her son and she secretly nursed her son for three months 
taking care of him, but it came to a point where she could not hide him any longer. And so what, she, what does she do? Well, in faith, she releases her son, and she trusts God. I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to release him. So she hides him in a basket. She puts him among the reeds in the river bank there in the Nile River. And I'm just going to trust you, God. And it just so happens, it just so happens that he gets found, and it just so happens he's found by the daughter of the Pharaoh. The Egyptian princess finds him, and it just so happens that this princess has pity on this child. She cares about him. And it just so happens that she says, find an Israelite woman to take care of him and raise him. And it just so happens that the Israelite woman who gets called upon to raise this child found in the river is Jochebed. How in the world are all these coincidences, coincidences happening? How in the world are, are, are all these things coming together? Are you kidding me? It's no coincidence. God has got this thing rigged. It's like he's writing this story. He is a sovereign God who provides for all his sovereign plans. God's got this thing rigged. And so Jochebed gets to nurse her own child, and nobody knows it. And so she gets to raise this little baby. By the way, his name is Moses for the next few years. And I don't know how she raised him. I don't know how she was spiritually caring for him. Maybe she was teaching him to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, something he would grow up to teach other people. Maybe she was teaching him about the covenants that God, Yahweh, made with your patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that one day he's going to bless our nation and he's going to lead us into the promised land. I don't know if Jochebed was instilling faith into her little treasure. But I do know this, that God was filling Jochebed with crazy faith. I know that. How do I know that? Because Jochebed came to a point when Moses grew up old enough where she had to do for the second time what many mothers would struggle doing once. She released them once again, and she trusted God's sovereign plan. I mean, I, I imagine she's seen God's sovereignty in all of this. Like, his hand is all over this kid's life. He not only brought him into this world, but he's, like, arranging all this stuff. He must be sovereign over his life. And so I'm going to release him to you, and I'm going to trust in your sovereign plan. And who in the world knew that Moses, this prince of Egypt, because she released Moses to the daughter, the, the daughter of Pharaoh, who adopted him, who knew that this prince of Egypt would become the hero of Israel? Who in the world knew that God would use Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and spread God's glory all over the land as he brought them through the wilderness? Who in the world knew that Moses was the one who was going to set the captives free? Who in the world knew? God knew. God absolutely knew it even before he was born, and Jochebed trusted that God. And so she releases her child, who was her treasure, right? Moses, Moses was her treasure, and yet in faith she gave up her treasure to God. God, here you go. This is for your greater glory. Do with him as you please. And she saw God's sovereign providence at work, and so she trusted his sovereign plan. I want to ask you a question because this is something we can all learn. Everyone listening, we can all learn this godly wisdom from this unsung hero. Our greatest treasure is to be used for God's great glory. And so my question to you, what is your treasure? Seriously, think about that right now. And if, you, if, if something comes to your heart, write it down. What's your treasure? What is your greatest treasure? How can you steward it? to be used for God's glory. Is it your child? Is it your business? Is it your body? Is it your house? Is it your hobby? Is it your skill? Is it your ability? What is your greatest treasure that you see in your life? This is good, I love this thing. But now how can you use it for the glory of God? 
I'll give an example. Maybe it is your ability. Uh, I, I mentioned on Friday night, my wife and I were sharing with the young adult ministry here, and they were talking about identity. That was the topic for the night. And I, I shared with them how I've come to find my identity in teaching, teaching the Word of God. And I'll tell you why that's become my treasure. Because I've learned in my life that I don't do things well. I don't do many things well. I've, I've worked many jobs before becoming a pastor, and I didn't do them very well. I think about a time when I, I used to work at a video store in Lomita. Uh, my, friend, my friend and their family owned this store. Some of you guys remember Super Movies and You. And so I worked there. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out the system of restocking the, the video cassettes. And, and then they tried me behind the counter, and I couldn't figure out how to do the transactions and how to work this register and how to do the math, and I just could not do it. And I didn't realize how, how much I was holding the business back until I was checking the schedule for the next two weeks. And, huh, huh strange. You guys forgot to put me on the schedule. Right? Like, as I talked to my friend who, whose family owned the store, I said, hey, I think your mom forgot to schedule me. And she goes, hmm. <laughs> she goes, no, you're fired. <laughs> right? Like, not in those words, but basically, they let me go. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, dude, I, I don't do many things well. And so when I started teaching the word of God, I, recently, I realized, hey, I think this is something that I'm at least a little decent at. And so my identity became tied to this. My value and my worth was found in this. It became my treasure. And the question I had to ask myself at some point is, am I using this treasure to bring God glory? Or am I using it to bring me glory? Here's where the rubber met the road. 2009, my wife and I, we were praying about going to Taiwan to be missionaries. And in my mind, I thought, man, there's only about 3 to 6% Christian in Taiwan. I can go and preach to the Taiwanese, and maybe we could see multitudes of people come to Christ. I said, yeah, let's go to Taiwan. And as we're talking to missionaries in the application process, they said, hey, that's great, Greg, that you think you can teach, but you know what? It's more important for the native Taiwanese pastors to preach to their own people. So you can still use your gift of teaching. It might be on a different stage. It'll be a different avenue. It'll be to teach the pastors, to equip the leaders of the churches so that they can teach their people. So you'll preach to a few, and the few can preach to the many. Are you okay with that? And I had to really ask myself, am I okay with that? And I had to realize that any treasure I have that God has given me is for his glory, not, not yours, for his glory. And after wrestling with that and God doing heart surgery with me, I, I, I realized this is what it's about. And so Monica and I went ahead and we finished the application to become missionaries in Taiwan. Well, God closed the door on that opportunity and he put me in the right place. And I'm not just talking about physically here at South Bay Community Church. I'm talking about spiritually. He helped me understand what my treasure is meant for. So what is your treasure? What is your treasure? And maybe some of you guys, like Jacobed, would say, yeah, my, my children are my treasure. They're like my greatest priority. They suck up most of my life. My life has become about them. They are your treasure. And we love the accolades, right? I, I, know, I know how we are, moms and dads. Like, we love the accolades that our children receive. It's like we live vicariously through them as if their successes are our successes. And so we'll invest the money in the private coaches. We'll invest the money in that private tutoring because we love the accolades our children will receive. I, I want to ask you, dad, mom, grandmother, grandfather, will you treasure God's glory more? Will you love God's glory more? Where instead of delighting in comments like, man, your son is the best player on the team. Might you train them so that one day you'll hear, man, your son is the best at loving the misfit, the outsider in our youth group. Instead of delighting in that comment, man, your, your daughter has won so many awards. May you pray that one day you'll hear, man, your daughter has won so many over to Jesus Christ. Would we be more joyful over the fact that your child brings glory to God rather than the fact that your child brings glory to you? 
And so how can we tr- use our treasure? How can we steward the gifts that God has given us for God's greater glory? What is your treasure? And like Jacobed, how can we release it and say, God, it's yours. I want to use it for your glory. Nothing happens overnight. Significant things happen over many nights. And use your greatest treasure for God's great glory. I want to I close by sharing a, a, a story that I read this week. It's a testimony from a, a mother named Sherry Rose. And here's what Sherry Rose wrote. She wrote this. She says, when I first became a mother, I wanted my son to see for himself the hand of God moving in his life. So I began to pray with him when he was only two, two years old. Almost every day, Jake and I kept our appointment with God. We would ask him to use us to do his work that very day, and I was so encouraged to see a little boy be so passionate for prayer. Since he was two, she would pray with little Jake, and he would learn to pray. And then she tells the story when, he, when Jake turned 13 years old. 13 years old, they're living in this small town in central Oregon, There's no malls in that small town in central Oregon. And so they would save up their money throughout the year so that once a year they can drive into Portland, go to the mall in Portland, and just splurge. Just go on a shopping spree and spend all their money all at once. And so that they they came when Jake was 13 years old. They were going to drive into Portland and use all their money that they saved up. And right when they get to the parking lot, Jake jumps out of the car, and his first stop is the computer game store. He already knew the computer game he wanted to buy, and so he's off, and he's, he's walking to the parking lot really quickly. His mom's right behind him, and right before they enter the mall, Sherry Rose says she sees this young teenage girl curled up on the bench outside of the mall, shivering. And because she was a Christian, Sherry Rose says, I wasn't about to just, I wasn't about to just walk by. She says, Jake, come on, let's go see what's, what's going on here. And so she asks she asked the teenage girl, she says, can I pray for you? And she said, that teenage girl just snapped back at her, just cold. Not just physically cold, but emotionally cold. She said, whatever, whatever. And then Sherry Rose says, okay, I'm, I'm not going to walk away without praying for you. I'm praying for you. And she just prays over her. She prays that Jesus would provide for her and, and take care of her and protect her. And she says, as I'm praying for her, she just starts crying uncontrollably just sobbing. And after the prayer, she says, the teenage girl started to tell me why she was there. She said, me and my boyfriend, we, we got pregnant. And I, don't, I wanted to keep the baby, but my parents wanted me to abort the baby, but we didn't want to abort the baby, so we kept the baby, and so they kicked me out of the house. So she said, she and her boyfriend became homeless, but because they came, became homeless, they couldn't take care of the child, so they had to put the child up for adoption. So now they're without a child, and now they're without a home. And she was just broken. And just as as that teenage girl was telling Sherry Rose the story, the baby daddy, the, the boyfriend, walks up, and he joins that little conversation. All the while, 13-year-old Jake is just standing there, and he, at that point, he says, Mom, it's time to shop. And Sherry Rose goes, Jake, did you, just not, did you not hear what she just shared? He says, yeah, mom, and that's why we got to go shop. We got to go take care of them. So Jake takes the boyfriend, and he goes and helps spend his own money to buy this this boyfriend shoes, a new backpack, new clothes, and he helps take care of the boyfriend while Sherry Rose takes the teenage girl, and she goes and does the same and takes care of her and spends her money on her. Sherry Rose is the best part of this whole day was that when we came back together, we were able to give them the best gift. That's Jesus Christ. They told them about Jesus, and they said they accepted and they received Christ into their life. After that day, Sherry Rose and her son got funds together to help them get off the streets and move into an apartment. And here's what Sherry Rose wrote. She wrote this. She says, as Jake and I drove back home without any shopping bags in our car, Jake said to me, Mom, that was the best day I ever had. At that moment, I realized that Jake will never remember anything I bought him when he is old, but he will never forget the day God used his life to bless someone else. This 13-year-old kid 
was learning to lay his life aside for someone else. This 13-year-old kid was learning to use his treasure for God's glory. But that didn't happen overnight. That happened over many nights. That happened over many nights where, where Sherry Rose would steward this treasure, her son Jake. And she stewarded this treasure to bring God glory, kind of like Jacobet. But it didn't happen overnight, over many nights, when she would train him as a toddler, praying with him, making appointments with God, kind of like Lois and Eunice. So my question is, what is your treasure? How can you use it for God's glory? I want to challenge you, make a commitment today. Start looking for those opportunities to use your life, your treasure for God's glory. But let me remind you, it may not happen overnight. The fullness of its impact may have to come after many nights of faithful commitment. Amen? Amen. Would you guys bow your heads with me? And I want to give you a moment to just talk and pray and if the Spirit is moving in your heart, just make commitments to God. Recognize whatever it is He has blessed you with. Whether it is your children, your possessions, your career, your mind. If God should so move you, make a commitment. Say, God, I want to commit today to start applying this for your glory. I know it's not going to happen overnight. It may take years before I see the fullness of its impact. But help me to be faithful and intentional and committed. I'll trust your sovereign plan. So God, we are so deeply thankful for all that you have given us. Every single one of us are here on this earth because you've given us a mother who went through the pain and the patience and the suffering to bring us into this world by your sovereign plan. We know we're not an accident. We're no mistake. You have this thing rigged. You're the author of our lives. And I just pray that we would be faithful with the life you've given us. Thank you for our mothers. We thank you for uh, every blessing, good and perfect gift you've given us. We acknowledge it's from you. We acknowledge it belongs to you. So help us to use it for your glory. Help us to learn from the godly examples of Jochebed and Lois and Eunice. Hide, hide this word in our hearts. And remind us of it in the most opportune moments. God, we, we want to use our breath now to worship you and praise you. You're worth it. And so we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.